we're going to Solstheim at level 1. The hardest content in Morrowind. Hard even for endgame characters. And we're going in at level 1. And just to be a bit spicier, I'm not allowing myself to use potions. So here's the rules. No prepping beforehand. Once I'm out of the census and excise office, it's straight to souls time. No bugs or exploits. The difficulty must be turned up to 100 because I hate myself. And no spell making. In fact, there are only two spell merchants on souls time and they don't sell much of anything useful. I'm playing on the OpenMW engine using the iHeart Vanilla mod list. It's mostly just a collection of bug fixes, graphical improvements, and quality of life tweaks, like hotkeys in the UI. Other than that, there's nothing incredibly game changing here. This challenge would be exactly the same in Vanilla Morrowind. It just look way Way uglier, and that's saying something. What's your name? Who am I, Jub? Why, I'm a guy that's totally not a werewolf. While we travel to Kull to take the boat to Solstheim, let me explain my character build choices. If you've watched my Tribunal from Level 1 video, then you should throw out all that explanation because this build couldn't be any more different. First of all, I'm choosing to be a teeny tiny wood elf, not just because of the boosted marksmanship and sneak levels, but because they can command beasts once per day for 600 seconds. Not every beast on Solstheim will be affected by this power, but some will, and that'll be more useful than you think guy that's totally not a werewolf is going to be an archer. There aren't very many good weapon choices for archers on Solstheim, but melee is super risky and scary. Our marksman level is starting at 50, so our accuracy will be pretty good right out the gate. And we can improve it pretty fast really early on. You'll see. I'm also taking sneak because maybe we can get some sneak attacks. Sneak is weird in Morrowind, so who knows. Athletics and acrobatics because I'm going to be running and jumping a lot, and I'm going to be running and jumping away a lot. Illusion as a major skill will start me with two spells, 10% Chameleon and 10% Sanctuary. How useful will they be? I don't know, we'll find out. Minor skills, mercantile and speechcraft for bartering. Security because there are a lot of locked chests on Solstheim containing enchanted arrows and bolts. Hand to hand because there's one quest that forces us to beat up a Solstheim native in aid of a foreign occupation. And restoration because... what else? Maybe I should have taken a melee skill? Whatever. Speed and agility are my favorite attributes so I can run faster and be a tiny bit more accurate. Stealth specialization to start with 10 more points in my stealth class skills like marksmanship or acrobatics. And finally I'm taking the warrior birth sign. It adds a flat 10 points to attack effectively increasing our accuracy by 10%. And this is added on to our accuracy calculation after factoring in fatigue. No fatigue or full fatigue, this will add 10% accuracy regardless. Ah, we've made it to Solstheim. time. Just breathe in that really cold air, but like when you breathe it in really hard, it hurts a little bit because it's way colder than your lungs. Well, we just ran here, so we're puffing and puffing. Let's drop everything first. The overwhelming collection of loot I've accumulated on my travels through Vardenfell, we don't need it. We're here at Fort Frostmoth, and the soldiers here won't interact with us until we sort out their alcohol problem. The problem being they don't have any. There's some in the office of the Fort Priest, Antonius Nuncius, and we'll need some of it to get on the soldier's good side. So let's steal it. Why does the priest keep this booze tucked away in a corner like he's trying to hide it we'll learn why soon enough but the soldiers actually aren't that desperate because quest scripting demands them tell us to go see captain falks carius the guy running the fort before we do anything when we meet him he tells us that the soldiers assigned to this fort have it rough fort frostmouth isn't an easy place to be stationed and sometimes the men can get a little on edge cold wet and miserable the island ain't that great either but carius's troops never shirk their duties until now They'd begrudgingly do what needed to be done, but it still get done. Now, morale couldn't get any lower. Because we're just some random schlub from the mainland, he figures we'll be able to glean a bit more info from the soldiers. I'm just a civvy after all. Taking a lesson from the old school RuneScape school of ingratiating myself to others, if I talk to soldiers with booze in my inventory, they'll smell it like a bloodhound, which is a way more metal name for an animal that looks like it's melting. Oh, yeah, uh, the guard will smell the flynn so we can give it to him, and then he'll reveal that Fort Frostmoth is a dry fort. Comments on a previous video told me what dry means with respect to alcohol, so this means the fort is not sweet. Huh? It means there's no alcohol? Will these winos make up their damn mind? So it seems the captain banned liquor. When we confront the captain about it, he says he never officially banned it. He doesn't care that the men drink. It's the priest that has a problem with it. But the alcohol shipment stopped coming months ago for some reason, so banning alcohol didn't even matter. If we confront the priest, he also seems baffled that the captain would ban alcohol. And when we ask him about the shipments no longer arriving, he gets super defensive, like comically defensive. So he's he's definitely got something to do with it. Fortunately, Tamriel doesn't have legal protections against unwarranted searches of people's belongings, and even if it did, I'm never reading him above the law. Time to search his office once again. But let's just loot this crate out by the docks first. It's full of weapons that we can sell to Zeno Faustus, the fort's weapon master. I assume he's a weapon master. He sells weapons. His shop is just below the priest's office, so it's on the way. In the priest's office, there's a locked desk. I don't have a lockpick, but surely there must be a key hidden around here somewhere. It's pretty well hidden, though. And it's hard to grab the damn thing, especially when you're so freaking short. Got it. If we unlock his desk, 
is full of booze. And there's 256 septums with my name on them. I'm not going to drink any of this booze, by the way. You could argue alcoholic drinks are just the products of culinary alchemy. A brewer's potion. I will give some of it to Zeno Faustus, however. We'll need his disposition higher for later, and we'll be doing a lot of bartering with him, so anything that tips the scales in my favor, even a little bit, is worthwhile. Before I leave, I'll buy an iron crossbow and some iron bolts. Crossbows will be my weapon of choice for this run, not because they're inherently better than bows, but because they don't have a damage range. The bolts do, but the range on bolts is much tighter than the range on regular bows. The further back you pull a bow, the higher the damage it'll do. Crossbows don't really have a variable draw distance, so it's a minimum and maximum damage is the same. The bolts do have variable damage. Steel does between 2 and 4 damage, for example. It's negligible, honestly. The appeal of crossbows is that you can fire them quickly without losing too much damage as a result. Upon returning to Antonius and confronting him about the booze we found in his desk, we have a choice to make. We can either report it to Carius, or we can keep his secret. I went with the latter because he'll give us a key to his cupboard that is filled, like just loaded, with tons of booze. We could possibly sell that if we're strapped for gold at some point. We'll keep that key in our back pocket for now. Now that we've got this introductory Solstheim quest completed, let's look into some more gear upgrades. So there's actually another shop on Solstheim, but it doesn't exist yet. The East Empire Company has a presence on the island, and naturally they want to set up a colony to strip the island of its natural resources. The leader of this branch of the company, Carnius Magius, lets us join the EEC, putting us on track to help develop the colony of Ravenrock. If you've played Skyrim's Dragonborn DLC, that name should sound familiar. This colony will eventually have a traitor after a few quests, of course. So let's back burner the main quest of Solstheim for now and do a bit of work for the EEC. The first quest for the company is to escort a few workers from the docks to the Ravenrock settlement site. The site's a bit northwest of the fort, so it's not super far. However, there is one thing I want to grab before I head off. I feel like everything up to this point has been, let's do this one thing, but first let's do this thing. This NPC outside the fort, Reinhardt Redspear, has something I want. How do we get it from him? It's a Huntsman crossbow. Although not deadly on its own, it is known to cause car accidents when it drops into someone's lap from under the sun visor. That's probably too subtle of a joke. Huntsman spiders are harmless on their own, but they sometimes cause car accidents because they like to take up residence in parked cars and they'll scare drivers at inopportune times. This is, this is apparently a thing in Australia. There are Huntsman spiders in other parts of the world, so it probably happens in those places too. The crossbow deals 25 damage, five more than the iron crossbow, a 25% increase. There's actually another Huntsman crossbow available on the island, but it's much more out of the way. It's easier just to kill a man. Gonna wear his armor too, so I'm not naked. The armor is unlikely to do anything, but whatever, it's cold. I need to bundle up. My, my nipples are rigid. These three fine fellows need an escort. Solstheim is full of wild beasts, naked nords, and Frisa hags. Although they just seem like ladies with daggers. Something I'm confused about is how sneak attacks work in Morrowind. I know if you attack while undetected, you'll do extra damage, and you'll get a little pop-up. Oh, yeah, get them, boys. You get a little pop-up on the bottom of the screen saying you performed a critical strike. But sometimes if I attack from a distance while sneaking, the first hit will seem to do more damage than the next hit, but I don't get the pop-up. Do I need to be within sneak range of the target to get a sneak attack? Or can I sneak attack from far away with a bow? Oh, we got a straggler. Oh, thanks for hitting me in the crossfire, dude. Surrender your life. Uh, what? I will end your pain. It seems the most dangerous creature on this island is man. Well, I guess he's technically a mer, but... You know those dinosaurs from Jurassic World that would attack anything marked with a laser pointer for some convoluted reason? It was in Marwin first. It's a little different. Got a new hat and a dagger that should sell for quite a bit. Good job, guys. You too. When we make it here with the boys, Falco Gallinus, the site manager, asks that we bring some ebony back to Carnius to prove to him and the colony's investors that Raven Rock is worth it. Oh, duh, bless you. We need four more pieces of ebony, and fortunately, there's some right nearby. How convenient. That's just how rich the island is. Time to exploit it. I ran out of bolts on the way back. Fortunately, wolves are easy to outrun. That's not survivalist advice, though. Don't try to outrun a wolf. They will catch you. I'm no outdoorsman, but I'm pretty sure wolves got humans beat in the naked combat competition. Get guns involved and it's a different story. I mean, it's not fair because wolves don't have thumbs. We give Carnius the raw ebony and he pays us 100 gold. Oh, but we also get a stock certificate. Wow, we're paid with stock options. If we do more quests and improve Ravenrock, the certificate will appreciate in value. I 
I feel like I'm being taken advantage of. Before leaving, let's buy some more ammo from Zeno. 400 iron bolts should be good for now. Even turn a profit thanks to that enchanted dagger. Back to Raven Rock. Fortunately, we can charter a boat from the Fort Frostmoth to Dock now and get there just a bit faster. When we return, Falco tells us about this Nord, Hraldar the Strange, who's disrupting the company's operations. Carnius would just prefer we kill the guy, but Falco suggests we just rough him up. He's, he's, a, he's a kinder, he's a kinder fellow, Falco. And this is why I took hand to hand. A fully drawn back fist deals half your hand to hand level as damage to the enemy's fatigue before knocking the opponent down. With a low hand to hand level, we'll be missing a lot and doing very little damage. With a level that's too low, we might not be able to out damage Hraldar's natural fatigue regeneration. He doesn't attack us back though, so we can stand behind him in sneak mode and get free sneak attacks by punching him in the butt. It still takes a while though. But after we punch his butt enough, he gives up and Falco pays us a thousand gold for our efforts and then sends us off to Carnius to tell him the news. But we gotta walk back because there's no boat available at Raven Rock yet. Soon though. Rather than fighting these two wolves by myself, let me show you the power of the Wood Elves. And now he's our friend for 600 seconds. Oh man. What the? Oh. oh. Don't you hate it when you backpedal into a polar bear? If I had a nickel. Here's something that crossed my mind while doing this quest. Why is ebony a mineral? In real life, ebony is a type of wood, and not like a specific species of wood, but like a category of dark hardwood. So what's the deal with ebony in the Elder Scrolls? What's going on? Well, I looked it up, and it's actually the blood of Lorcan, allegedly at least. After Ariel and Trinimac ripped out Lorcan's heart at the Adamantine Tower over in modern-day High Rock, they chucked it across Tamriel. It landed in Vardenfell, Red Mountain, where it remained for thousands of years. As it flew, Lorcan's blood spilled across the land, leaving ebony deposits behind. This is why there's so much ebony in Morrowind and trace amounts in Skyrim. It makes the crafting of Daedric armor in Skyrim much more sensible. Add the heart of a Daedra to the blood of an Aedra. A Petamaic Aedra, but whatever. Carnius is disappointed that we didn't just off the Nord, but as long as the work continues, he's satisfied. After waiting three days for our next task, Carnius tells us a supply ship should have arrived from the mainland, and he wants us to check up on the delivery with Falco. Of course, when we get back to Raven Rock, we learn the ship never arrived. Falco is not all that surprised since Carnius never commissioned a dock to be built, at least not one big enough to accommodate a supply ship. We do have a small dock though, so we can travel back and forth from Fort Frostmoth now. It's nice. But the missing supply ship is our priority. Gim and Gareth, the putts that punch me to death in a different Kalpa. Headcanon all branching save files are different Kalpas. He says he saw some lights to the northwest. Raiders? Reavers? Suppliers? Who can say? Maybe he should have told Falco. On the way out of the camp, we jump once and are now able to rest and meditate on what we've learned. Level 2. Strength, Agility, and Speed. In case I miss any level ups, come back to this part of the video and rewatch it because all my level ups will be exactly like this. Strength, Agility, Speed. All the other attributes, I don't care about. You in Oh, Dark Brotherhood. Oh my god. This is gonna be a pain in the ass. Should have installed that mod that delays their attack. Oh well. We're coming up to the first real challenge of this run, Draugr. If you're only familiar with Skyrim's Draugr, or Oblivion Zombies for that matter, you're in for a surprise. Morrowind's Draugr are fast. It's not so bad since we're out in the open right now, but imagine entering a tomb and having one of these guys bolting right up to you. Thankfully, they don't hit very hard. I can actually survive a hit or two from these guys. They stagger pretty reliably too, assuming you can actually get a hit off, and they look stupid as hell when they do get hit. Even with no fatigue like right now, my accuracy is still around 60%. It's not that bad. But having full fatigue is still better, so running into new cells to rest up is still a viable option. I'm gonna have to rely on it pretty liberally. This cave is public property, so I can't rest to restore my health for some reason. Full fatigue is good though. Oh no, Wolf, don't start with the- wait, I can tame him. Get him, pup. Good job. Hmm. Betrayal. Perhaps I should have foreseen this. One Draugr left. Something I was wondering was why Draugr are so damn fast in this game, but not nearly as fast in Skyrim. You know, what changed? They're based on real folklore creatures, Scandinavian in origin, so it makes sense that they'd be in Skyrim. So I looked into them. They're not zombies in the sense that they're just reanimated corpses. They're more like corporeal ghosts. So they have all these wacky supernatural powers like superhuman strength and the ability to enter dreams and create darkness. Just create darkness. They just they just make it dark, I guess. Oh, and they could shapeshift and swim through stone. Yeah. What I'm imagining is a bunch of medieval Norse folk sitting around a hearth, 
one-upping each other about some monster they said they saw, everyone adding something more and more ridiculous. And I was able to escape. That's nothing, I saw one that could do roundhouse kicks. Anyway, I think the speed gives them the appearance of swimming through walls when you're in a crypt. They just kind of show up out of nowhere, like they no-clip through the scenery. Know of any other weirdly overpowered folklore creatures or obscure facts about commonly known ones? I'd love to hear it. This isn't just a play for engagement, I'm actually curious, this stuff is interesting. Did you know Sphinx and Sphincter share etymologies? I'd explain why, but I have to escort this lady back to Ravenrock. Well, actually, I have to get some picks off the ship. It's an optional part of the quest that I thought was mandatory at the time, but it's optional, and if I had known that, I wouldn't have actually done it. But you can get 3,000 gold for bringing all six back to Falco. But how on earth do you get onto the boat? Well, let's skip ahead a bit, because I spent a good 15 minutes trying to get up this dumb friggin' rock. I guess the assumption is you'd use a levitate spell, or a potion or something. Or you just have higher acrobatics, because you wouldn't be level 2, and you'd be able to clear this jump pretty easy. By stripping down and dropping everything in my inventory, and jumping around like a lunatic, I realized I I should try jumping from an angle. And sure enough, it worked. I collected the picks, picked all my stuff back up, and headed back for Ravenrock. But where was the lady? Oh, she's up on the ship. You know, in most scenarios, the dickhead you're escorting needs to be right up against you to actually load into the new cell with you. But this woman, she was standing on the rocks in the ocean and still managed to follow me up into the ship, loading into the ship's interior cell, trapping her on the goddamn boat. So I reloaded, told her to stay put. Went through the whole process of dropping my stuff, jumping on the ship, collecting the picks, jumped off, re-geared, then had her follow me. Now we can return to Raven Rock. This berserker looks different. Oh my god, how much health does he have? What the- I'm not even making a dent! Oh my god, this is a werewolf. Oh, I can't do this. Come on, lady. Just- just run away. I- You know, all things considered, good on her for surviving this long. Please, be careful! It's like a horror movie. Look at him. All right, I got an idea. I just can't thank you enough for rescuing me from that horrible shipwreck guy that's totally not a werewolf. Why does everyone keep saying it like that? I'm not a werewolf. Falco gives us 3k for the picks, and he tells us to report back to Carne Asada, who gives us 300 gold. How generous. If we wait three days, he tells us to go bother Falco for an assignment because he doesn't want to look at us. And he's rude. Excuse me. Excuse Dude, move. I. Why are the halls this narrow, Bethesda? And shouldn't they spiral the other way? So a right-handed defender attacking from above would have an easier time attacking the attackers coming from below? Or is that just a myth? Maybe the majority of people in Tamriel are left-handed. Perhaps this is a mirror universe where the chirality is flipped. Ooh, the, the consequences for chemistry is staggering. That's, that's, that's where magic comes from. If you flip the chirality of all of our biology, we become magic or we die. Can you tell this part of the voiceover is being recorded on a different day? At this point in the Raven Rock questline, we can either side with Falco or Carnius. But it doesn't matter because we're ditching this questline after this next quest, the one that gets the traitor into the colony. I'll go with Falco just because I'm here already. He asks if we want to bring in a smith or a traitor. We'll go with the traitor because they have the potential to carry some interesting marksman items. It's random, so it might not be all that interesting, but eh, let's roll the dice. But before the traitor will get built, we have to go back to Carnius and let him know our decision. While we're here, again, let's carry on with the main quest. With a matter of the forts and morale being solved and the alcohol being discovered, oh, the shipment was found. The captain now wants us to investigate some weapons that are being smuggled away from the camp. We can proceed with the help of one of two soldiers, Sanius Lucius or Gaia Artoria. The former is more a talker than a fighter, the latter is a fighter, not a talker. I'm going with Gaia because we need a fighter, trust me. Lucius would actually be the better option if we had an invisibility spell. I'll explain why in a bit. It makes sense that Xena would know something about the missing weapons, and because we raised his disposition earlier with booze, he's more than willing to tell us what he's heard. To the northeast, in the Gendrung Caverns, a few soldiers are storing weapons there. Likely the weapons that are going missing. They're the smugglers. But we're not going to go there just yet. <laughs> This is how it always is. There are some really good items I need to loot first. Super good items. Items we're gonna want before we go into this next phase of the main quest. We'll stop by Raven Rock again and update Falco so we can get started constructing the trade house. We'll need to talk to Carnius again before it finally opens, so that too is backburnered. But right now we gotta go to Thursk. It, it's this little, not a village, it's like a mead hall, kind of in the middle of the island. And if you've played Blood Moon before, I'm pretty sure you know what's waiting for me there. So, if this were happening in real life, obviously these guys wouldn't survive a dozen crossbow bolts to the chest, and if they did, they wouldn't still be running at full speed at me. But if they could survive these attacks, how long do you think it would take before both sides just realize that we're both wasting our time? 
how long does a fight have to go on before everybody just forgets why they're mad <laughs> and we all just walk away? Well, I guess if the Hundred Years' War is an indication of anything, quite a while. At least we got a level out of it. Strength, agility, and speed. Loot from these guys isn't that interesting. Ooh, lockpicks. Somewhat interesting. And a new hat. This is, uh, this is a wolf, I guess. Behind the Thirst Hamid Hall is a hollow stump. And in that stump is a pair of enchanted gloves with Fortify Sneak and Fortify Security for 20 points each. Constant effects, by the way. There's also a ring that gives 20 points of Night Eye and 20 points of Marksman. Super powerful for this build. There's also Shadow Sting, a sword with a weird enchantment. Five points of poison for 20 seconds. Cool. And 200 to 100% chameleon for 20 seconds on the target. 200 to 100%. And you turn the target invisible. What? Finally, five ebony arrows of slain. Damage health, 5,000 points for one second on target. Basically, I have five instant kills. Quite powerful, quite dear. To be treasured and used only when absolutely necessary. I already know one enemy I'm going to use this on, for sure. Try to guess what it is. Oh, engagement. Gundring Cavern. Jesus, Gaia. Chill out. It's, it's just a rat. I love the gumption, but I need you to save that passion for the other guys. Okay, here's the first enemy. They're really strong. They have a lot of health and they shrug off my bolts like I'm shooting them with spitballs. Gaia does pretty good damage. The problem is, if I want to run away and not get one shot, she has trouble catching up. One piece of good news though, their attacks are so strong, it doesn't matter that all their weapons have a paralysis effect on them. I die in one hit regardless, so effectively, I'm immune to paralysis. <laughs> Oh yeah, they heal up to full at half health too. You see why I took Marksman? That took about five minutes of constant kiting. And we'll sell his enchanted axe. An on-strike paralysis enchant sounds useful, but my axe skill is like five, so I, I have no interest in using it. And here's why I took security. These chests are all over the island, and they can contain decent loot, sometimes. In this case, 15 viper arrows. Poison, four to seven points for 10 seconds. Not bad. I just need a bow to use them. We'll get one later. Ooh, more lock chests. Scroll of Onducy's Unhinging. Cool. That's actually a good sign because that means these chests can roll on the random scroll loot table, so we might find some pretty powerful scrolls. Or we might not. We probably won't. Also, a weak fire damage ring and a short duration blind ring. I don't know if I'll actually use these, but I'll take them since rings barely weigh anything anyway. Wish I could pick this level 80 chest. What mysteries do you hold? We'll never know. You're not even trying. Hey, this is working pretty well. He's not covering much ground between the staggers if... Shit. <gasps> Gotta keep these fights 2v1. 2v2 is a fair fight, and fair fights are dumb. Okay, Gaia. Wait here, and don't run in like a maniac. I'll lure this guy out. Go ahead, stranger. You'll be dead soon. Excellent. Now we kite. You're not even trying. Two down, three to go. Oh, thank Talos for these repair hammers, I tell you. Alright, orcs coming. Yes, friend. Well, don't just yes, friend me, help. I said earlier, invisibility with Lucius makes this part of the quest a lot easier. If you picked Lucius, you can talk to the smuggler's leader and come to a deal. With invisibility, you can leave Lucius at the start of the dungeon, sneak through the caverns, and talk to the leader without fighting anyone. Lucius doesn't even need to be with you. Anyway, this orc's kicking my ass. He's fast as hell, and Gaia is having a lot of trouble keeping up with him. I'm bringing him to the front of the caverns because kiting him here in this long hallway is a lot easier than dealing with bumps and rocks and weird tunnel geometry. And if I need to, I can run out of the cave and rest. Come on. Almost dead. Come on. Come on. <gasps> Ooh, man. It's like there's a wasp in the other room, and someone in the house already swatted it. But you don't know if it's dying or it's just really pissed. And someone has to go back into that room. Gaia, what do you do? Attack him! You're not Jeez. Okay, two more left. Oh, another orc. Why are they so fast? Okay, I brought him to the kiting tunnel as well, but I'm running out of bolts. I'll be right back. Since we're back in Frostmouth, we might as well check in on Carnius and get that whole traitor thing sorted. Omniscient narrator here. This detour will cause a lot of pain. 
If we tell him the work on the trade house is almost done, that makes it done. Yeah. You know what? Let's actually go to Raven Rock and see what the trader has, because maybe they have something in stock that'll make the next two smugglers easier to fight. Place is shaping up nice. This interior seems like 10% too big. Know what I mean? What you got for me, Sathan? Lots of unusable potions, silver bolts, silver darts. Those might help with fighting werewolves. Some enchanted throwing stars. Those don't restock though, I'll get them anyway. Shock three to seven points for one second. Eh, it could be worse, I suppose. You know, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little disappointed. Really not much of anything there. <sighs> no matter, back to the caverns. Um, where's Gaia? I left her at the fort, didn't I? Man, these darts really aren't doing any- Ooh. Hey, I got a level. Damn it. Damn it. No. Did I just screw myself? Oh, good. Man, that would have sucked. The only thing worse would be saving during the death. Surely that won't happen, right? Hoo boy. Finally, Fort Smuggler down. Time to deal with the leader. Take that. Sword? Okay, I need Gaia back. And I need to repair my crossbow. Please be at the fort somewhere. Huh. Oh, it's you. Man, Gaia's aggro as hell. Well, that was easy. I don't know why I didn't... No, oh, whatever. Let's go report to the captain. Look at that. They added a more convenient pathway through the wall. That was nice of him. Bit messy, though. Oh, there was an attack while we were gone. Pretty fast attack. According to Luscious Lucius, the captain done gone and went missing while the fort was being attacked by strange wolf creatures. You must find him, guy that's totally not a werewolf. Dude, I understand the subtext. Don't go blaming me for your fort's poor planning. So I get an audience with the Skull, the nature-worshipping Nords native to Soul's time. Lucius suggests I bring them the Skull of a Skull Warrior. Personally, that seems a bit distasteful. If somebody showed up on my doorstep and presented me with my great uncle's skull, I'd assume they were here to start some shit. But Lucius is apparently the clever one, so I'll give it a shot. Might end up tripping neck first onto an axe, but whatever, to the north. And here we are at the Skull Village. Hello, Tharston. I'm here to inquire about wolf monsters. So the good news is he's happy we brought him a dude's brain case. Bad news, he doesn't much care for the Imperials. They desecrate the land and they don't respect the oneness of nature. And that's oneness with a capital O, so you know it's important. Even with that in mind though, the Skull said they would never dare attack them. They prefer watching the Imperials kill themselves slowly, succumbing to nature itself. But the Imperials' utter disregard for the oneness of the land has put things out of balance and we, the mighty, not technically Nerevarine, but canonically I am that right now, must perform the rituals to fix it. We must restore the power of the Skull. We're sent off to Korst Windai, the Skull's seer, and he gives us all the required paperwork for the task before us, and a little bit of documentation outlining the locations we need to visit. There are six ritual stones across the island of Solstheim, and with each stone comes a specific ritual that we must perform. Some are simple, some are grueling, others require creative solutions. You'll see. Well, let's get to it. We'll go to the Windstone first since it's the closest, and there's a group of smugglers to the west of the Skull Village, some of whom are carrying bows. I'll still use the crossbow primarily, but it'd be nice to have a bow on hand just in case. Make use of those enchanted arrows. It's only a short bow, so it's not that great, but it'll have to do. Another level, strength, agility, and speed. What an upset. The ritual we must perform for the Windstone is to go to Glenishul's tomb and free the winds from the greedy man's sack. I hope it's not a euphemism. The tomb is southeast of the lake. We'll actually be passing by the Beast Stone, so we'll swing by that on the way. Reeklings are annoying, but at least they aren't damage sponges. I know, I know. I chose to play on max difficulty. Everything's a damage sponge. But some mobs are spongier than others. These Reeklings, they're not that spongy. So the Beast Stone wants us to go south and find the good beast. It's being attacked by Reeklings and we gotta rescue it. Easy because the bear tanks the damage for us. Hard because the bear is in guardian spec, so he's squishy. If you don't play WoW, that makes no sense. We gotta kill the Reeklings before they kill the bear. Those poison enchanted arrows should come in handy. Spread some damage over time around on all of them. Well. Damn it. Lots of luck involved with this.
We did it. Just gotta pull this arrow out of the bear's paw, wait for him to heal up, and then escort him back to the ritual stone. We can actually just run back to the stone without waiting for the bear. It all counts anyway. He'll be fine. He's he's a polar bear. He's, he, this place is great for him. One ritual down, five to go. Onward to Glenishul's tomb. So here's the deal. This tomb is full of Draugr and Bone Wolves. And outside the tomb is this reekling boar jockey. Now they are damage sponges. This is going to be tough. I have no delusions about being able to fight my way through this place. There's barely enough room to kite one Draugr, let alone the five or six that are in here. It might be more than that, actually. But all we need to do is get to the end of the dungeon, open the sack, and then run out. We don't actually need to kill anything, but that's easier said than done. Of course, the corridors are wide enough to look like they can squeeze two people through them, but it's not so simple. These tombs are made by the same guy that built those fort stairwells, it seems. Are bone wolves tameable? Are they beasts? Nope. Look at this mess. Oof. Stupid. Oof. 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 Yes! Oh my god. To think, in only 200 years, these Draugr are going to be shambling corpses. That was exhausting. It took less than 10 minutes of attempts. I only have 10 minutes of footage of it, but it felt like hours. I need a beer. You fool. I don't even like beer. This entire thing was recorded in post. I'm not exhausted. The voiceover is separate. Everything is a lie. YouTube is a lie. You can't prove you're not a brain in a vet. The tree stone wants us to collect some seeds. He who controls the seeds controls the trees. There's a reekling, incorrigible little things, with the seeds, and when we approach, a bunch of spriggans attack. At the behest of the reekling, of course. We could kill the spriggans, but the problem is you have to kill them three times before they stay dead. Rather, if we focus on the reekling, we can loot the seeds, and that'll make the spriggans nice and docile. We trained for this with those reavers. As long as we keep out of range, it should be fine. Oop, a bear's joined the fray. Maybe she can help us. Nope. At least I'm accurate. 72 base marksman, and then the ring brings us up to 92. 70 agility and 40 luck. Doing the math, that works out to 82.5% accuracy when I have zero fatigue. Throw in the warrior birth sign, and I'm 92.5% accurate. I don't know how much evasion chance the enemies have, but it doesn't seem very significant. And when we loot the seeds, as you can see, the spriggans stop in their tracks. That bear is still a problem though. Now we just need to plant the seeds just a bit northwest of the tree stone. And there we go. Ritual of the tree completed. Way easier than the wind one. Next is the Ritual of the Sun, not far outside Fort Frostmoth. The stone wants us to go west and free the warm sun from the halls of Penumbra. There's a nice path laid out for us too, look at that. Straight ahead. Gotta be quick though because the wildlife is chasing me. I feel like that goes without saying, honestly. And now we're safe in the cave so we can rest and heal up from the damage that the wildlife did to us. Oh my god, what the f- Okay, we're not gonna rest. That summons the undead, I guess. Here's what we'll do. Backpedal to Fort Frostmoth while donating a few dozen arrows to these wolves and berserkers. Great, the guards are helping now. Oh, uh, really guys? You're just gonna kill the wildlife, not- Can, can you help with these other lunatics? <sighs> Fine. We're gonna have to fight our way past quite a few Draugr, so we want our crossbow to be as mint as possible. Let's get some repairs. The condition of your weapon affects its damage, if you didn't know. I'm also gonna buy some throwing stars, not because I think the damage will be great, but you can throw them quickly, and that might make it easier to stagger lock some enemies. Probably not, but it's worth a shot. Okay, let's deal with these idiots.
that was a bit tedious. It would have been nice for the guards to help, but at least I could sell their daggers. You know, thinking about it, I'm actually going to buy back one of these iron crossbows. It's not as strong as the Huntsman, but because weapon condition is directly proportional to your weapon damage, it might be useful to have more than one weapon. A weapon with 50% condition does 50% damage. So if my Huntsman crossbow gets to like 75%, it'll be the same as a fully repaired iron crossbow. It's just good to have backups. The iron crossbow will be really good for wildlife because it's going to take three or four shots from either crossbow to kill the thing regardless. So this will just save condition on the Huntsman itself. Oh, and we got level six. Strength, agility, and speed. Now we're back at the Halls of Penumbra. There are quite a few twists and turns in these caves with locked chests at the end of many of them. As much as I love to roll the dice for better and better loot, I don't think fighting through all the Draugr is worth it. I think avoiding a Draugr fight is better than whatever loot the chest might have. Uh, near perfect accuracy is so nice. Whoops, yeah, don't rest. That attracts them. Rest outside. It's really hard to take Draugr seriously when every time you hit them, they dab. It was 2003, so I guess they're ahead of their time. Cool. Enchanted arrows. Frost damage. Basically useless. Everything on Solstheim is either heavily resistant or immune to frost. So you see that at the end of the tunnel? That's a Growl. I'm honestly not sure what a Growl is supposed to be. Perhaps it's some obscure Norse and mythical beast. To me, it just looks like an elephant troll. It's got tusks, but it doesn't have a trunk. I don't know. Regardless, they have a ton of health. And like the goblins in the Mournhold sewers, they deal damage at the beginning of their attack animation. It makes avoiding damage kind of tough. Oh, and they have ridiculous health regen. I don't think I can kill this thing just with bolts. This is worthy of an ebony arrow of slaying. You might think the enchant reflected back onto me, but no, that was just an animationless attack from the growl, unless contact caused the damage or it like charged into me. I don't like them. All we need is the eye off its corpse and then we can use it to thaw this ice wall. This makes all the torches in the caverns ignite and undoubtedly fill the tunnels with carbon monoxide. Ugh, Draugr. What a headache. Sunstone's happy. That's four now. I haven't returned to the windstone yet, so technically only three rituals are done. We can get back to that later. Let's deal with the earthstone now. It's pretty close to Raven Rock, so we can just return to Frostmoth and boat on over. We can even restock on bolts and darts while we're there. There's the earthstone up ahead. Just gotta take out these wolves. Not long now. Ugh, who's that? Oh, Christ, it's the level 90 guy again. Um, uh, I'm gonna have to take the long way around. My victory is at hand. Are you kidding me? He's at the stone? Screw it, we could probably outrun him. Let's just activate the stone and head off to the trial. We need to learn the Song of the Earth from the Cave of Hidden Music. It's not far from here. And now there's a- Oh, wait, actually, the wolf can be a distraction. Fantastic. Have fun, you two. Neat, a level. But can I rest with my wolf friend fighting for his life all the way back at the Earthstone? Ooh, I can. Cool. Strength, agility, and speed. The Cave of Hidden Music. Of course, there's Draugr in here, but only in the first half of the cavern. The second half has no enemies and has several chests we can loot. A level 80 chest. Ooh, it's not too complex. We can unlock it. Two rings with blind effects, 10 to 30 points and 1 to 40 points. Unlikely I'll ever use them, but I'll take them anyway. Ooh, fire enchanted bolts. It's a weak enchantment, but better than nothing. Not a lot of fire resistance on this island, I think. And there's also a single throwing star. Oof. Poison ring. Decent, I suppose. And frost enchanted bolts. Eh. You know what? I'm just going to run into the next cell. I'm right nearby. Don't got to fight these guys. <gasps> this next part of the caverns has a lot of chests to unlock. They mostly contain around 15 enchanted arrows or bolts and sometimes an enchanted item and maybe a couple repair hammers and soul gems. The occasional piece of jewelry. I won't list all the loot, just the notable things like this ring that fortifies enchanting by seven points for 30 seconds. I don't have a way to cast soul trap, so I doubt this will ever help me much, but who knows? Maybe I'll find a scroll that allows me to soul trap some.
Now that we're at the end of the cavern, we can conduct our trial. What we have to do is copy the pitch of the stalactite's gases by clicking on the correct stalagmites. It's not just click the one that the gas is flowing into. You need to match the acoustic pattern, not the visual pattern. I think it's the same pattern every time though. So if you have trouble discerning pitch, you can just look up the answer. Middle, right, left, right for the first pattern, then left, right, middle, left for the second pattern. Well, speak of the devil, scroll of Ferrigarath Soul Eater, we can enchant something. But what should we make? I'll think about it. Don't want to jump the gun too early. Oh, right, the Draugr. Guys, please, move. I, I just want to leave. Here we go. So, I'm thinking the best thing to do here is to take pot shots at them to slow them down while I run backwards and run away so I can get out without having to kill them. Shit, they blocked me in. Oh my god, stupid, stop going to the right. These friggin' walls. Almost there. Come on. Almost. Man. Oh no. No. No, no. Oh, please. I saved mid-death. Well, at least I have an autosave at the beginning of this dual Draugr gauntlet. Time to start this escape all over again. No, go left. Wait a minute. Darts are fast and they stagger just as well as crossbow bolts. It's less damage, sure, but I don't care about damage. All I care about is staggering them. Oh my god, again? Seriously? I hate this game. Okay, almost there. Please, please. Come on. Oh, fresh air and sunlight, how I missed you. Oh. And that ritual is complete. Huh, they're still fighting. Weird. Not my problem. One ritual left, the water stone. Did you know, in terms of human anatomy, uh, all this snow is gonna add so many compression artifacts to the video. Let's be real though, YouTube's compression is iffy on a good day. For the water stone ritual, you're supposed to follow a horker along the surface of the water and then swim into a cave deep underwater. But if you know where the cave is, you could just go straight to it. In the cave is the water of life and we gotta get it. Without any spell effects, you can hold your breath for 20 seconds. After those 20 seconds, you start taking three points of damage every second until you surface or you die. Once we enter the cave, we need to swim through this winding tunnel. I have 53 health, so that means I've got less than 38 seconds total to go from the surface of the ocean to the pocket of air at the end of this cavern. And I can't do it. I know if you reduce the ratio of your carry weight to carry capacity, that allows you to run faster, but I don't know how much that affects swimming. I know higher athletics increases your swim speed, but I don't know if dumping my inventory will help me here. You know what? I have an idea, but I need to go back to the Skull Village. I really wish I had Mark and Recall. Since we're walking past it on the way to the village, let's just finish up the Ritual of the Wind real quick. So there's a total of two spell merchants on Solstheim, as far as I'm aware. Marisa, an Imperial Cult monk who you need to rescue, so that's a whole ordeal I don't want to deal with. She could stay kidnapped or whatever the hell's going on with her. Then there's Bronrod the Roarer in the Skull Village. He sells a lot of weak fortify skill spells and various absorb attribute spells, reflect, dispel, you know, simple things. But most importantly, he sells a single healing spell. Rapid Regenerate. Restore 5 to 10 points of health for 20 seconds. I literally have only a 1% chance to cast this spell. Doesn't inspire much confidence. And unfortunately, there are no spell makers on Soul's Time, so I couldn't make a weaker version of this even if I wanted to. Or could I? Let's Soul Trap a Reekling using that scroll I found. Soul gems are in a bunch of the island's chests, so I made sure to grab a common soul gem while I was in one of the tombs. And I looted a ring from one of them because I had a feeling I might need it. All I have to do is enchant this ring with a 3 point heal spell. My enchant level is low, and my intelligence level is low. And that ring that we found earlier, the one that gives 7 points of enchant for 30 seconds, that's pretty weak. But when you think about it, it more than doubles our enchant level, so it's significant. I have a 15% chance to successfully create a 3 point heal spell over 5 seconds. There's an option 
option within OpenMW that tells you the success chance of Enchants, by the way. You could toggle it on or off. 15% isn't that bad. And no lie, I literally got it on the first attempt. This should do it. Before we leave the Skull Village and go back to the Waterstone thing, I want to talk to Lasner and start his quest. It's a short quest. He's looking for his son, Timval. He fell down the well. Lasner gives us a key for the well, and we can enter it, swim through the flooded cave system, although this one's not as long, so we don't drown, and then we emerge in another cavern filled with skeletons. They're easy enough to kill. We find Timval deeper in the caverns, and it seems he's obsessed with the robes he's wearing. Something, something, forces of darkness. Killing him is an option, or we can tell him his father is looking for him and that his father loves him. This breaks Timval from his power crazed madness, and he gives us the robes. We can return to Lasner to tell him the fate of Timval, that his son is going to leave Solstheim to study true magic instead of evil, dark necromancy magic, and Lasner will give us some animal pelts as a reward. The better prize is the Mantle of Woe, and woe indeed. Look at this enchantment. It drains your personality by 100 points, increases your weakness to normal weapons by 20%, and causes 20 points of sun damage per second. So it's basically a nightgown. But most importantly is that it fortifies your conjuration by 50 points and fortifies your maximum magicka by five times your intelligence. These robes give you 500 points of magicka if you have 100 intelligence. It's pretty wild, but I'm not going to use it. I figured if I didn't talk about it, a bunch of people would say that I should have gotten it so I could cast a bunch of spells that I don't have the level to successfully cast anyway. Whatever, I got it. I'm not using it. Anyway, back to the main quest. Now that we can heal ourselves at the same rate that drowning damages us, we can freely drown without dying. Imagine that horror, that pain. Your blood is filling up with CO2. You have that constant urge to breathe, beating against your chest. But every whisper of death is kept at bay with a simple enchantment. And then when you finally emerge from your eternity submerged, a goofy skeleton tries to kill you. We're just here for the water of life. I feel like this is some environmental storytelling. Someone came here, died, and became a skeleton. But why did they die? They didn't drown. They had potions, and the potions are in the cavern. It's a mystery. Well, back in the drink. My favorite evolution used to be Vaporeon. What a surprise, the internet ruins everything. There's a cavern west of the Skull Village, Frikte. Uh, yeah, I'm sure I said that right. And there's an item in there that I want to loot before we return to Korst Windai. This cave is full of skellies, but they're pretty weak. And even though a bunch of them have shields, you can't actually block ranged attacks in Marwyn. Kinda silly, but it works in our favor. How do you think he died? Ah, here's what we're looking for. A second Huntsman Crossbow. Always good to have a backup. Now that all the rituals have been performed, and the power of the skull has been restored, Farston Heartfang awards us with a really powerful mace. But it's useless for this build, and it's really friggin' heavy, so we don't need it. And now Tharston wants us to prove our wisdom by solving a crime. Rigmore Halfhand has accused Engar Icemane of theft. He says that Engmar stole furs from his home, and sure enough, the furs were found in the possession of the accused. The punishment for theft among the skulls is either exile or sacrifice to the wolves. Metal as hell. If we search Icemane's house, we can find a note under Reese's pillow, clearly written written by Rigmore. He's mad that Reese stays with Engar. He says that Engar is a lout because he's away for weeks at a time. You know, hunting and collecting resources to keep the village from dying. But yeah, he's a selfish prick, that Engar. If we talk to Reese, she reveals that she had a brief affair with Rigmore. Give him us a cookie. When we confront Rigmore, he realizes the jig is up and accompanies me to Tharston, who leaves it up to me to decide his fate. We can have him exiled or sacrificed to the wolves. I'm gonna go with exile. It's Rigmore's preferred punishment, but I'm not doing it for him. He he's probably gonna end up getting eaten by wolves anyway. But this way, he'll be dishonored by the skull and stricken from their cultural history. But I'm pretty sure you actually have to watch him get killed before you can move on with the quest, so it's faster just to exile him. As a reward, we get a new hat. Helm of the Wolf's Heart. It fortifies both agility and sneak by five points. Next, we need to prove our strength. Course Windai is waiting near Lake Fjalding, ready to explain exactly what we have to do. So the lake's discharging some kind of orange magic. That's probably what Course wants to talk about. Yep. Tharston believes the Draugr Lord Aeslip is the cause of the disturbance on the lake. Beneath the lake is a frozen cave system on Solstheim. What? And Chorus wants us to go in and deal with them. More Draugr, hooray. The Skull Fear, this is the second sign of the Blood Moon prophecy. The first sign is the coming of the Hounds, werewolves, which we haven't seen yet. The second sign is fire from the glass eye, that orange effluvia coming out of the lake. The third sign is the tide of woe. It's when a bunch of horkers start washing up on the shore, massacred by the dozens, perhaps hundreds. But at least that hasn't happened yet. I'm gonna break up my fire enchanted bolts for these caves. The last thing I need is a 2v1. 
When we approach the Draugr Lord, he stops us and begins to talk. As it happens, Aeslip isn't evil, according to him. The Draugr in this cave are not his kin, according to him. He was once a Skull who was exiled for performing dark magics. Over the years, he learned of a Daedric plot to destroy his people. He erected a magical barrier to keep the Daedric contained, but he knew his finite life would eventually end. So he turned himself into a Draugr, gaining immortality so he can maintain the barrier and protect the Skull. He asks us to help him clear out the Daedra in the caves. We'll agree, but really we just want the Daedra to kill him. Listen, I don't have to help this guy. I could kill him right now and be on my way. But the Daedra, the Frost Atronax in the cave, they're way better equipped for killing Aeslep than I am. So... He's weak enough now, I think I could finish him off. And we can take his ring. Fortify willpower 10 points and magicka 75 points. Not game changing, but it's neat. Korst is pleased to hear that Aeslep is dead. What about the Atronax? Who cares? On the way back to the village, we can enter the Thirsk Mead Hall to see quite a tragic sight. It seems this place has been assaulted by some unknown force. And this Woodbeam seems to be wearing a pair of glowing boots. I, I must take them. Ooh, 10 points to athletics and speed. Thank you, Beam. I'll cherish them always. Back to the Skull Village. If we talk to Tharston, he tells us he's too busy to talk. It's a full-time job, standing there with a vacant expression. Maybe Korst has something. <gasps> What's this? Werewolves are attacking the village. Wow, yep, that's, that's werewolves, all right. Fortunately, the Skull Warriors are pretty good at killing werewolves, so I kind of just jumped around and poked them where I could. Honestly, the Reeklings that followed me from Thursk were more of an issue than anything. With all things clear, we can report back to Tharston, but he's no longer in the Great Hall. Also, there's werewolves here, and they attack us. They get a ton of health, so this is going to take a while. Somehow, I managed to trick one into staying downstairs, so we can 1v1 this one upstairs on the catwalk. What's great is that werewolves don't have reflect, so I can finally put a bunch of these enchanted arrows to use. This is pretty much the last chance we'll actually have to use them. Can you guess why? With those two bad boys dead, they're not good boys, they're bad boys, we can leave the Great Hall and find Korst just having arrived, conveniently after all the chaos. He tells us that we've been infected with a werewolf disease, Sanes lupinus. Sanes lupinus. Sanes lupinus. Korst says if we don't find a cure soon, we'll become a werewolf ourselves. To protect his village, he tells us to leave until we're cured. But here's what he doesn't know. We ain't getting cured. Outside the village, I rest for a few days and... Oh, woo. Look at me. I'm a good boy. I just need to kill a few humanoids every night so I don't lose a bunch of health. It seems the Skull want a tussle. <laughs> oh, this is so dumb. <laughs> oh, it's like, it's like we struggle this whole time up to this point and then it's like, okay, you, 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 you paid your penance. Here you go. Have fun. So if you're curious what lycanthropy entails, here's the gist. Every night at 9 p.m., you turn into a werewolf. This lasts until 6 a.m. You need to frequently kill humanoids lest you lose health throughout the night. I think you also lose some stats. If you don't kill any humanoid NPCs, the next day you'll wake up reverting to your humanoid form with some damage to your health. It's not a big deal, honestly. But if anyone sees you transform, the whole world will know you're a werewolf, even if you kill the one person that witnessed it. That's an issue, but for this playthrough, who cares? The benefits of being a werewolf is that you're super fast, can jump really far, have powerful claws, and you're pretty damn sneaky if you need to be. Also, you have night eye, and you constantly restore one health per second and you can detect humanoids on your map and a lot of people run away from you in fear reasonable we'll be finishing the main quest as a werewolf if you couldn't guess i literally don't think it'd be possible otherwise and i'll explain why when we get to what i think would be a roadblock for the sake of transparency open mw comes with an option to make strength affect hand-to-hand -hand damage and you can toggle whether strength affects werewolf claw damage i have both of those options toggled off for this run <laughs> This feels good. This, this is cathartic. After our first night of furry debauchery, whatever you're assuming I mean by that, you're right. We revert to a naked wood elf, waiting until night once again, and we're given a vision of Hircin, Daedric Lord of the Hunt and the creator of werewolves. Your master has a task for you, my own. In the tombs of Scalara lies the totem of claw and fang. There, I wish it to remain. When the skull come for it, Hunt them down, kill them all, and protect the totem.
If we had cured our lycanthropy and sided with the skull, this part of the main quest would require us to enter the tombs of Scalara, or Scalara, Sclera, Scleroderma, and get the Totem of Claw and Fang. Not defend it. As a werewolf, we need to defend it. Which is kind of weird, you don't think of werewolves as defensive creatures. And that sounds simple enough, but instead of Skull Warriors, when we come here as a humanoid, we need to fight through tons of werewolves. At the end of this dungeon is a chest with a totem in it, so you need to go loot the chest and then run back out while being chased by werewolves or not being chased by werewolves because you killed them all. Werewolves are hard to kill and you need a lot of space to kite them, especially when you're not doing a ton of damage. I could barely fight Draugr in tombs. Werewolves would be an absolute nightmare. Rather, as a werewolf, I just need to kill the skull as they spawn and try to take the totem. If they reach the chest at the end of the dungeon, they take the totem, but they stand there like idiots so I can kill them really quick. Once they're dead, the totem returns to the chest by magic. Taking this path does technically make the challenge easier, but I just don't think the other path would even be possible. I mean, maybe it would be, but I really doubt it. I'll leave that as an exercise for the viewer. So this is fun. Werewolves get boosted sneak. It's almost 100. It makes sneak attacking way easier. I can just about one-shot them with critical sneak attacks. Kill the beast. After about two dozen skull hunters are killed, they abandon their quest for the totem. If we wait again, reverting to a wood elf, and then back to a werewolf, You have performed well, Hound. The totem is undisturbed for now, and your master is pleased. I grant you this boon to aid you in your hunt. Your claws are now as sharp as the edge of my spear. Let all who would stand before you feel their edge. We will speak again. Our claws are now stronger by something like 40%. Not bad. Thanks, Hearsene. If we wait again, revert to a wood elf, and then back to a werewolf, there's a lot of this. It's pretty silly. Hearsene contacts us once more. It is time to serve your master again. The totem was stolen while the hounds slept. And the skull prepare to hunt the spirit bear this night. Hunt the hunters and slay the beast. Okay, so the skull got the totem anyway. I, w I, I was here in Skalara this whole time. Now they're trying to hunt the spirit bear. They need its heart, and Hircine wants us to stop them. The task is similar to what we did in the tombs of Skalara. Rampant slaughter. West of Lake Fjalding are hunting parties, and we have to go there and murder them until they give up. When they do eventually abandon their efforts, we need to track down the spirit bear and kill it ourselves. Hopefully, there isn't another bear they can just so happen to get a heart from. Your master is well pleased. The Skull find no fortune with their god. I grant you this boon for your service, hound. When you walk in the day, you may now summon a companion to your side to aid you in your travels. Hunt well until I call upon you again. Yeah, so we can summon a corpse dog now when we're not in werewolf form, but we're not going to not be in werewolf form, so whatever. Wait, what elf? Wait. I have another task for you, Hound. There is a castle of ice to the north under siege from within by renegade servants. I have need of the master of this castle, and I do not want him distracted by this foolishness. Go there, kill the rebels, and end the siege. Now this next quest would be torturous if we sided with the skull. It might actually be impossible too. More impossible than the Skalara one. Let me explain. As a good boy, you can walk in through the front door of Castle Karstag, and the Reekling Dulk tells you to clear out the Grawl in the caverns below the castle. Krish is some other Reekling who's using the Grawl as mercenaries of sorts. If you side with the Skull, you enter the castle from the caverns themselves, and you need to help Krish kill the Grawl because they betrayed him and ate some of his friends. Typical mercenary behavior. The problem is, Krish helps you fight the Grawl, but you can probably tell who's the stronger combatant in a 1v1. Krish is squishy, but you need him in order to enter the castle because magical barrier. He won't help us enter the castle until after we clear out the Grawl, so we have to kill all eight of them with him first, and we can't tell him to hang back and not help. So I don't think it would even be possible to kill even a single Growl before Krish gets turned into a fine paste. Ironically, when we take the werewolf path, we don't only have to kill the Growl, but we also have to kill Krish.
Now that everything is dead, we can return to Dolk, and he's happy the problem's been sorted out. Now, we wait for more treats from here soon. You have ended the siege at Castle Karstark, and your master is well pleased with your efforts. You have served me well, and I offer you this gift, the Hunter's Wind. May you never tire in your hunting, my hound. I will seek you out, should I need you again. We can heal for a thousand points of health over one second once per day. Powerful power. Useless because we can't use powers as a werewolf. Oh well, let's wait another cycle. Oh uh, yeah, it's normal for one to be bigger than the other. Ah, you have arrived. The others have been here for days now, and you are the last. It is time for my hunt, and you are to take part. I have chosen only the most worthy to take part in the hunt. Carius of the Imperials. Heartfang of the Skull. The Frost Giant Karstab. And you. You have proven yourself a worthy hunter, and so you have been given this honor. You and the others are to find your way to my hunting grounds. Take great care, as only one of you will earn the glory of facing the hunter himself in battle while the blood moon lights the sky. The others have gone ahead, so only you remain to begin. Beware, mortal. My hounds are about, and they hunger for blood. Perhaps I will see you soon. Now go. People thought this would be the hardest part of the challenge. Not so. When we first enter the maze, we find Captain Carius. Remember him? I don't blame you if you forgot. That was a while ago. He recognizes us somehow, and attacks immediately. And he's easy to kill because he's a man, and I'm a freaking werewolf. So you're probably wondering, how are we going to handle all these werewolves? There's got to be at least a dozen, maybe two dozen in this maze. We could go through them, one or two at a time, maybe get a sneak attack here or there, or just book it. I really don't know if Bethesda actually intended for us to kill all the werewolves. I think they expected you to run through the place and get chased. If you do this quest as a man or myrrh, you need to find a chest containing the key so you could pass through the portal at the center of the maze. And if you're fast enough, you can grab it from the chest and still avoid the werewolves just fine. It's a bit silly when you got 10 wolf men tailing you, but if it's stupid and it works, it ain't stupid. As a werewolf, we don't need the key. We can just run through the portal. And after we run through that portal, we encounter Tharsten Hartfang. He tells us he's been wearing Hircine's ring for generations, and he wants the glory of facing down Hircine himself. We're standing in his way, so we gotta fight. He was a werewolf this whole time. He takes on his true form. But little does he know, I haven't been using even 10% of my full power. Second verse, same as the first. Run. You can just loot the key you need from Tharsten's corpse. And that's the maze. The final fight before we confront Hircine himself is against the frost giant Karstag. If you've played the Skyrim Dragonborn DLC, you might have found this guy's ghost. I considered reverting to wood elf form and just hitting him with an ebony arrow of slaying, but where's the fun in that? Frost giant? More like, uh, more, more like, imagine I said something clever. So, you are the one. You have escaped my hounds and beaten back the other challengers. I had rather expected the giant to prevail, but no matter. You have proven yourself a worthy hunter, and you have earned the greatest honor that can be bestowed upon a mortal. You are to be my prey. I ask you though, what is it that makes a hunter great? Is it his strength, the speed with which he strikes, or is it his guile, the ability to outwit his prey? Answer me, mortal, and decide your fate. 
Here Scene has presented us with a choice. Fight the aspect of strength, the aspect of speed, or the aspect of guile. Strength is a bear, speed is a wolf, and guile... Gu guile's a dude. I've never actually fought the aspect of guile, since the rewards from the other two are better. At least I feel. But let's mix things up. Let's go crazy. So you have chosen, and so shall be your fate. To face me in all my glory would be less than sporting. So you shall face but one of my aspects, the one you have chosen. We have little time. The blood moon sinks low in the sky. Prepare yourself, mortal, for now you are the hunted. <laughs> Oh, so I need to keep away from him as much as possible. That, that's this challenge in a nutshell. Speedy little hit and run attacks. See the green? Jump the hell away. We need to turn back into an elf to loot his corpse. It kind of undercuts the whole, oh, I'm a werewolf and I won the fight sort of a thing. I just got turned back into a friggin' Bosmer. Our reward is the key to leave this place in the Spear of the Hunter. On strike, 10 seconds of paralysis, 50 points of burden for 10 seconds, and four points of poison for five seconds. I feel like burden and paralysis is a bit redundant, but look at those damage ranges. 40 to 60 points of damage on thrust. Strong spear. It's a shame this run will be over shortly. Well, that's Blood Moon from level one. I'm exhausted, subscribe or whatever.